Hello everybody. Welcome to the August 8th The Nutritionist 2019 webinar. I'm Marianne Fessenden from AMTS. Our webinar presentation was recorded last week. Our speaker is joining after the morning and afternoon presentation to answer questions. Our series is co-hosted and broadcast in Argentina, Italy, Brazil, China, and Russia, so questions often come from listeners around the globe. At each, depending on how you are listening, you can submit queries through me or one of my attending co-hosts. Later, a complete recording of archived webinars, as well as the question and answer session for each, will be available on the AMTS website. For those of you who would listen to the presentations whilst driving, we have converted the videos to MP3 files that can be downloaded to your device for offline listening. Those podcasts can be found at the Ag Model Systems website under the Webinar tab or Resources tab. This month, we are very pleased to host Dr. Samuel Fezenden, who joined AMTS in 2016 after completing his PhD at Cornell in the Van Amberg Lab Group. He has been actively involved in the CNCPS model research for almost 13 years. He worked with the CNCPS group in undergrad years at Cornell and spent time focusing on fermentation in his master's at the University of Minnesota, working with Dr. Marshall Stern. Sam returned to Cornell for his PhD, where he focused on amino acid supply in lactating dairy cattle and protozoa in the rumen. In addition to independent consulting, Sam works for AMTS as technical support in European sales. His talk today will focus on the principles of CNCPS biology and formulating and optimizing within the program, a very frequently requested topic. Please enjoy our presentation. It is one of our longer ones, but the biology baseline Sam explains is critical to understanding how to approach formulation in any modeling program. After the, record after the recording, Sam will be joining to answer your questions. All right, well, thank you for the introduction, and I'm happy to be talking about this topic. Uh, I actually, we, we do get quite a few questions about formulation and optimization within AMTS, and so this is kind of, um, I, I enjoy talking about it, and I'll try to give you some of my perspectives, and I hope you can get some good things from this presentation. So we will dive right into it. So anytime I'm doing a training for nutritionists or, or working with farmers, I always ask this question. Um, it really kind of helps me frame what our focus should be when we're thinking about formulation on the farm. And this is, this is the question I ask, what is the largest factor leading to variability in feeding management on, on your farm or on your client's farms? And uh, based on the experience I've had, it basically, if I could guess what the, what the answer would be on most people's farms, it would be related to variability in forage dry matter because we always mix on an as-fed basis, that's AF. Yeah. Variability in loading or mixing of feeds because we do that also on an as fed basis, but there's also the human error of, you know, maybe we put in one, one little shake of the bucket too much and all of a sudden it's in the mixer and we can't take it back out. Uh, there can be variability in feed bunk management. This is what we see on the farm quite often where we're, we're walking around and we can see the feed bunk, you know, are they eating it consistently across the, um, across the length of the feed bunk? Are they, uh, offered at a similar time each day and all of those things that make the delivery of that final TMR uh, really a critical part of the, the whole equation and variability in forage quality information. So this is really how often and, and how accurately are you testing the feeds to make sure that you have good information going into uh, any of your formulation software systems. And the next question I usually try to follow that up with is can we actually implement a change in one of these areas within the next week? And I would venture to say that for the most part, yes, we can always do something better quickly and that will definitely see a, a positive return to the farm um, if we're working on reducing the variability in any of these areas. Now, when we're going to implement that change, what should we be using to actually fix the problem? Of course, AMTS will be willing to sell you a computer program, but that's actually probably not gonna fix the problem if it's doing, if it, if it is, if the problem is related to diet implementation. Because we can formulate a great diet in the program and we can use optimizers to do that efficiently, but if the implementation of that diet on the farm is where the problem rests, then this program's not gonna help you. We really should be focusing on something like this. A moisture tester, if we're trying to fix dry matter problems, uh, protocols, if we're trying to fix variability in, in um, feed management or feed bunk management, um, it really comes down to understanding what is going to be the, the true uh, thing to help you reach the goals on the farm. So why, why even use a formulation model or an optimizer? 
Um, that's kind of the question that I'm sort of setting up here. Um, the way I type, typically think about it is we can do these sort of thought exercises and say, okay, which feed is better at making milk? So I'll give you a few examples and you should be able to pick out which one's probably better at making milk. So corn silage or wheat straw, I'd venture to say corn silage probably is better at making milk uh, than wheat straw. Now wheat straw, of course, has a place in many of our diets, but just on the surface, corn silage probably makes more milk per pound than wheat straw or per kilo. How about whole corn grain or fine ground barley? This should be a fairly simple one too. Whole corn grain probably will not have very much rumen digestibility. It'll escape the rumen um, before it actually digests and doesn't really provide very much energy to, to the cow. And we end up just seeing this sort of uh, grain in the feces. Now, fine ground barley will digest fairly rapidly in the rumen, and uh, this will definitely provide a lot more energy to the cow, so probably more efficient at making milk. Now, something like canola meal or rapeseed meal versus a protected soybean meal. Uh, you could go either way, kind of depends on the quality of the product that you're getting. But in the end, probably pound for pound, the protected soybean meal will give you a little bit more um, uh, potential milk. And so then the question becomes, you know, which one should I end up feeding? Now, if you just make those decisions based on expense per ton, then that can be uh, misleading, especially if you have to start thinking about, maybe thinking about which one is less expensive per kilo of potential milk. Now that really complicates the, the question here because now, we actually have to adjust or we have to be able to account for the many different um, parts of the diet that all come together to make the TMR. And so what we can do when we're trying to think through these different feeds is we need to be using a feeding system of some sort to help predict that future performance. Because if we just did a guessing and testing type setup, then we probably would be spending quite a bit of money and time um, and not being able to actually get good results across uh, many different feeding systems. So that's where you know, I'm a proponent of using a mathematical model to help us make these decisions. But we have to remember that to effectively use any nutrition model or any formulation program, we have to understand the biology and the behavior of the cows first, because this is really um, what the model is trying to simulate. But you have to understand it's really just a simulation. Reality will always trump the simulation. So in that way, we always have to think, OK, what's the reality on the farm? What's the reality of the, of the biology of the cow? And can I use a model to help me maybe understand that? Obviously, the one that I prefer to use is the CNCPS, or Cornell Net Carbohydrate and Protein System. And the way I usually present this to people is it's basically a mathematical model accounting for supply and requirements of nutrients. And it's primarily focused around energy, protein, and amino acid balance. So when we talk about balance, what I mean is on the, let's say, left-hand side, we have the requirements. Generally, these are using empirical equations to, to predict the requirements. Uh, we're dealing with those physiologic functions, like I mentioned on the last slide. To really make this side click, to really make it be as close to the animal as possible, we really need to focus on animal characteristics. And then we do make adjustments for environment and activity that those animals are in. On the other side of things is the supply side. These are more generally going to be mechanistic equations in the CNCPS, uh, meaning that we are trying to describe the relationships of microbes to their substrate to then explain a higher level of being, such as the animal. Um, that's what that rumen submodel really is. And to get this side to work, we need to understand feed characteristics. And of course, we take into account a lot of different interactions between uh, the digestion of different feeds and how that affects the digestion of other feeds. That's associated effects. Now, if you go back to my 2017 webinar, I focused a lot more on animal characteristics. And in this webinar, we're going to focus more on feed characteristics. So there is a little bit of a theme going on here. All right. So focusing on that feed characteristics, especially on the supply side of the model, um, this is my one pager about the general idea behind the, the digestion calculations in the CNCPS. So basically, it revolves around this equation. This is probably the most central equation in the model. And it's actually fairly simple. One. So it's KD over KD plus KP. And this is what we use to determine the digestion of a, of a given nutrient. So what we are looking at here is KD. That's the rate of degradation. This is something that I say is more intrinsic to the feed. So this is a feed characteristic. And we have a KD, rate of degradation, for each protein and carbohydrate pool or portion in each of the feeds. 
So let's say corn silage starch has a certain KD. We combine that with the rate of passage or the KP. That is something that's more intrinsic to the animal. Okay, so that would be calculated off of the intake of the animal, the weight of the animal and state of lactation. Those are the major things going into the KP calculation. And when we combine these, we can actually calculate the digestibility. So we calculate essentially the disappearance of a given substrate from a compartment. Okay, and here we're saying the compartment is the rumen. There's only one way into the rumen, and there's only two ways to disappear from that pool in the rumen. One is via passage at a certain KP, rate of passage, and one is via digestion, or KD. So the only way to disappear from this pool is by being digested or being passed. We calculate the microbial growth rate of the microbes in the rumen directly from the carbohydrate rate of degradation. So the faster we degrade the carbohydrates, the more microbes we can grow per unit time. Okay, in this case, we're typically talking about per hour. So that's how we calculate the microbial yield. And it's also based on the nitrogen balance in the rumen that kind of modulates our microbial yield in some cases. And then from that, after we kind of get moved past the rumen compartment, we can talk about what's coming out of the rumen. So we, in the end, we'll get down to something called ME, metabolizable energy. And this is calculated from the digested nutrients. In some ways, this is basically a modified TDN system. And metabolizable protein. Again, this is going to be the sum of microbial protein and undegraded feed protein. So we're using the other side of this equation up here. So while we calculate digestibility, we can also calculate one minus that, which would be the undegraded portion. Amino acids are then calculated from the profile, amino acid profile of each protein source. So what I mean by that is microbial protein are assigned an amino acid profile and undegraded feed protein is assigned another amino acid profile based on the amino acid profile of the original feed itself. So that's how we calculate basically all the amino acids in the program. This is the one slide that hopefully summarizes that. All right, so diving into understanding what it really makes, what really makes that uh, system click. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the CNCPS feed fractions. And um, what I'm really gonna try to do here in terms of um, helping you think about formulation is which one of these feed fractions or which one of these analyses do I need to get done most often and routinely to actually use the model correctly. So here I've got this laid out as the, the protein and carbohydrate fractions of the CNCPS. So on the left side we have protein fractions. If you take the sum of all these together, that's going to be crude protein. Okay. What we do then is we split it out into ammonia, soluble true protein, NDIP and ADIP, and ADIP. So this is how we calculate each of the what we call the protein pools. And you can see one of them here, protein B1, is actually calculated by difference. So what we do is we take crude protein minus the ammonia and soluble true protein and NDIP, and that gives us our B1 pool. So what that means is actually all of the error of each of these different analyses are, is actually collapsed into this B1 pool, um, which can give us a little bit more variation in that pool, but it is also usually one of the largest pools. So the variation as a percent of the pool itself is actually fairly small. On the carbohydrate side of things, it's the same sort of setup. The red numbers here are the ones we can actually measure in the lab. And the B2 pool on this side is also calculated by difference. So that's why when you're characterizing a feed, if you see soluble fiber go negative, it means that the sum of all of the other pools actually adds up to more than the actual amount of, of matter available. So that's, this is where that error will end up on the, on the carbohydrate side and actually on, on the whole feed side too. So this is kind of the overview of what we actually need for the model. And if you look at the red values on this page, this is, these are the only analysis that we really need to make it work well. Okay. Um, a lot of the times we get a lot of different analysis, but this is really the core core numbers. So if we look at our feed, you know, tests when we get them back, I'm picking on a couple labs here, but um, you can see, and, and this has been a kind of trend in the last 20 or so years of just more and more numbers on feed analysis. Okay, it seems like every, you know, few months we get a new number or a new, new index to use. And, and in the end, I think it, it's useful because it provides a lot of value for the, the money that you pay, um, but it also can be somewhat confusing because a lot of the times we have questions from people saying, well, which number do I pick off of this whole sheet? You know, which one do I use? Which one actually matters? 
So that's something that we really encourage you to work the labs with and, and look through our materials. Um, if you're using a US lab that has, or at least a link to a US lab that has the standard XML, we work very closely with all the labs to try to make sure that that standard XML has the appropriate numbers coming in. So that's your best bet to know which ones are, are going to be the right ones to enter in the model. So to answer the question of, of you know, which one of all these speed numbers do we need, uh, the developers of the CNCPS actually went through and did a sensitivity analysis to help answer that question. And so what they're basically asking, and this is with uh, Ryan's paper here in, in 2015, this is the feed library paper of the most recent published version of the model. So what they did is they, they basically asked which measurements of composition are most important for prediction of ME and MP allowable milk. And so this is kind of a classic sensitivity analysis they went through and um, collaborated with several sources of data to bring in a lot of different feed analysis from all around the world. Um, so these are global databases. And they went through and they found out, okay, what is, let's say, the standard deviation of corn silage NDF? And so what happens if we increase corn silage NDF, one standard deviation, what happens to ME and MP predictions in the model? So what this means is that we're, sense, we, we're basically trying to measure the sensitivity of the model and it's taking into account the inherent variability of the global data set on NDFD of corn silage and then the model's um, sensitivity to that, okay? So what you can do is then you, you kind of create these sort of charts. And what it does is it, this is ranking the um, different nutrients by how, their, how strong their effect is on ME allowable milk or MP allowable milk. So essentially the interpretation of these charts or these figures will be that the higher up on this list and the larger the bar, the more influence that that individual measure will have on ME or MP allowable milk. And so it's reflecting that, that global variability in each of these different measurements. So when I'm looking at this graph, I'm saying, okay, if I were to only pick one measurement to, to take, I would probably be picking NDF. And this is just content of NDF in my forages because that accounts for the top three sources of variation in ME level milk and two of the top three sources of variation in MP level milk. Okay, so my take home here is, okay, I gotta test my forages at least for NDF, you know? Those are the biggest sources of variation and so those are the ones I really have to kind of go after. So let's talk about the other side of things, not only the composition, but we know that digestibility is also important. So this is evaluating the change in digestibility or one standard deviation increase in digestibility of a given nutrient, okay? So it's the same sort of chart. Um, we've just kind of switched over the shorthand here. So when you see CB3, this means carbohydrate B3. So that's basically carbohydrate NDF digestibility. So carbohydrate B3 is, is NDF. So NDF digestibility, CB1 is starch. So starch digestibility. PB1 over here, you can see is protein B1. That's that um, insoluble digestible protein pool. And so that's annotated here as BB1. So I'll, I'll help you out a little bit on this. I'll bring in the actual common speak, I'll say. So the ones highlighted in, in blue here are the fiber digestibility ones, at least the top ones. Uh, starch digestibility here is here in red, and then protein digestibility is here in green, okay? So the interpretation of this graph is, is very similar to the previous one. It's which measurements of digestibility should I routinely um, do to try to account for that variability? And um, here my take home would be, again, NDF digestibility is important, starch digestibility is, is very important, and protein digestibility, especially on the MP level milk side, can be quite important as well. Now I'm going to flip back to the previous chart here quick. I want you to just kind of mentally remember these two numbers here. So this is the um, effect of grass hay NDF variability on ME level milk. So basically, as I increase one standard deviation NDF content, I would expect 740 grams less ME level milk predicted out of the model, okay? So these are, you know, you can see here we're at 740 grams, uh, 580 grams, 700 grams, 770. So we're kind of in that uh, half a kilo to more um, range of, of variation. I'm gonna flip to the next slide now. 
check out this one, corn grain CB1. So the starch digestibility of your corn grain, one standard deviation increase is equal to almost two kilos of MP allowable milk. So this should tell you a couple things when you, when you actually think about that. It means that the model is really sensitive to the digestibility of, of starch in its prediction of MP allowable milk. Okay. So the other ones on the previous page were like 770 grams or so. This one is almost two kilos. So this should tell you that one, the model is really sensitive to variation in corn grain. And then probably two in the background here, there's probably a very large range in the global data set of starch digestibility on the corn grain. And this kind of makes sense intuitively because we know that corn grain is going to be characterized as corn grain going into the lab. So it could be whole corn, or it could be very finely ground corn. And we know the, the digestibility of those two feeds are gonna be very, very different. And so this is just telling us that there's probably a large variation in the global data set on what corn grain is, and that the model is pretty darn sensitive to it. So taking these two slides together, the ones that I would really be focusing on is making sure I understand my NDF amount and digestibility, my starch digestibility, and I'd probably also be trying to understand my protein digestibility, although that's a harder assay to do because we don't have a lot of good commercial assays for that. So let's piece through each one of these. So starting off with fiber. Just as a reminder, all NDF in the model is really technically considered to be ANDFOM. So that's neutral detergent fiber analyzed with alpha amylase and sodium sulfite expressed on an organic matter basis or expressed um, exclusive of organic matter, okay, or exclusive of inorganic matter, sorry. So this a ANDF-OM part is actually quite important, especially the OM, because the OM is what's going to help us account for dust and dirt and contamination in the feed, okay? And this is something that has had a lot more attention in the last 10 or so years, um, but it's really because we've started to recognize that that ash and that dirt portion of the feed that just gets incorporated during filling, during harvest and feed out, that actually can inflate the NDF value if we're not correcting for organic matter. So that OM is really important. I think, you know, you can probably find quite a few slides and presentations and, and some of our webinars that talk about this, so I won't harp on it too much. Um, but essentially, we really need to account for that, and it's especially important in flood irrigated soils and, and wide swathing of hay crop. You know, the more common practice now where we can kind of wide swath it, merge it, and, and get it done, um, that's contributing to quite a bit of dust in the feed in, in, in certain situations. And obviously not in everyone, but it's really why we're trying to standardize to that A and the FOM. Now, if we look at, that's just a measure of ANDF OM. Uh, now we're looking at NDF digestibility. Uh, previously, before the, what we call the three time point method, uh, we were typically looking at a single time point NDF digestibility. And so that's where I'm gonna say, okay, this is how most models or previous models had used digestibility of NDF to estimate um, the rate of degradation. So that's what this depiction is here. And I'm gonna use this using the, an example from actually one of our users. So this is a whole crop silage from the UK. And let's just take the traditional single time point. So if you were to send this, this sample in for 30 hour NDFD. So then they did, that's what happened here. So they sent it in, 30 hour NDFD was 31% of NDF. And they used the older method of lignin times 2.4 to estimate the, the indigestible NDF portion. And they ended up at uh, right around 30% of the NDF is unavailable. So 30 hours after digestion, we've, we've um, seen 30% 30, 30 of the NDF to disappear. And then after 240 hours, oh, sorry, after the estimation using lignin times 2.4, um, we would say that we have 30% unavailable for the microbes at all. And that gives us a KD of 2.1. And that's what this analysis came back with. This is what was entered into the model um, and what, what they were trying to formulate with. I'm going to flip to the next slide, and this was after, you know, after the farm had said, well, we're having some issues um, with intakes. We, the model's not doing a good job of predicting performance. Uh, the cows just aren't doing what we think they are or what we think they should. So we went back to the feed analysis and we said, well, okay, let's try to get some, some more information on that whole crop. 
And so this next slide is going to be adding in the other two time points at 120 hours and 240 hours. So what I want you to do when I flip slides here is keep your eye on this point here and you'll see that this point will stay the same because we're using the same 30 hour point. We're just adding in the other two time points. Okay. I'll toggle back and forth a little bit here. So you can see just by adding those other two time points and actually measuring the digestible pool, we got much different results. So what this basically told us is, okay, yes, 30% disappears after 30 hours, but after 120 hours, we really have not digested very much more, 36.5%. And then we get out to 240 hours, which we're gonna call our M point for digestion, and we've only digested 38% of the forage, which means right around 62% is totally unavailable. Oops. And this meant that the KD, the calculated KD using the model is gonna be 5.7% per hour. So it's a faster KD than was calculated before, but so much more of this feed is unavailable to the rumen, unavailable to the cow, that this is really just providing a whole bunch of bulk. And the cows have to really work their way through this to just pass it out of the system. And this explained actually, a, you know, almost a couple kilos of dry matter intake because they were feeding this like it was a forage that degrades like this. But the reality is there's so much more indigestible matter, just ballast, that uh, these cows could not process it fast enough to, to get it out of their system. So it's really helped because it actually was providing us with the actual measurement of the digestible pool and it helped give us a better idea of what that rate of degradation actually is. It more accurately reflects biology um, because we're actually measuring it, not just re relying on a 2.4 times lignin factor. And it also uh, reduces the estimation of that KD. So it reduces error in that estimation because we're no longer relying on that single time point. We actually have two other time points to work with and that lets us run a least squares regression which actually gives us a, a little bit better um, estimation of that KD in, in real life. And it actually helps us eliminate that debate of 24 versus 30 versus 48 hour NDFD because we're taking three other time, or we're taking two other time points outside of that zone that really helps us understand where that curve probably is. It also works well, this three time point method works well on forages and non forages alike. Um, we may have to add more time points over time, especially for some of our highly digestible forages, um, maybe a 12 hour time point. Um, but that's something that, you know, we'll have to see as we go down the road. But it does work well um, for both, both types of, of fiber. And it also has kind of given us this question of, of being able to use that unavailable fiber portion or UNDF to estimate intake potential. And so I just have a couple brief slides on this. Um, there's webinars available on this uh, platform that are that really go into the depth of this a lot more. And I really encourage you to look back at those. Um, but I'll just kind of give you a, a quick update on those. So starting off with that UNDF, kind of the formulation guidelines, um, early data coming out of Minor Institute had suggested perhaps 0.4% of body weight as UNDF on the total diet was, was maybe kind of like the fill maximum. And also therefore the dry matter intake maximum. 0.3% as body weight was also maybe what they kind of were considering the, the possibly the fill minimum for rumen health and functioning. And so you'll see these kind of out in the industry as, as possible suggestions, that kind of 0.3 to 0.4% of body weight as the UNDF targets. Um, but Miner was very clear to say these are, these are kind of early suggestions. It's based off a limited number of studies. So, you know, we're putting them out there to kind of see what the industry says about them. And, and that was, that was good because that's, you know, what we really are looking for is some, some formulation guidelines as it comes to these new measures. Um, but there were, of course, those caveats with this, with this sort of uh, prediction or this sort of measurement. So one thing that I think a lot of people maybe didn't realize or recognize is that this is on the total TMR. So you either have to measure the whole TMR for UNDF 240 which is really ends up meaning that this is after the TMR is mixed. So it's really a diagnostic or retrospective type of measure. Or if you actually want to use it in formulation in a prospective manner, then you need to be measuring every single feed that has NDF to be able to have numbers that relate to this 0.4 and 0.3. Because these were on the total diet, you need to measure everything that has NDF to make sure you accounted for all of the UNDF. So that, that's one thing to kind of keep in mind. 
And the other thing is as this got to be used out in the industry and especially got um, outside of the U.S. a little bit more, uh, we started to be able to test the limits and, and see where some of these other diets ended up. And so I kind of pulled together some data that, that I was kind of a part of or, or aware of. Um, if we look at Irish cattle, so these are 100% forage on pasture, they were eating 0.18% of body weight as UNDF. Okay, so it's far below our functioning rumen, you know, suggestion, but these cows are fine, right? These are 100% forage diets grazing. There's, there was, there were, were not issues with acidosis or questions about rumen health and function. And so the same thing here with English, these English cattle, um, they were eating highly digestible grass silage at 0.22% of body weight. Um, again, pretty healthy rumens, no real indications of issues. Um, and they were below that, that rumen health and functioning kind of guideline. And then let's take it on the other side of things, uh, looking at alfalfa hay as the only forage. So this would be uh, kind of typical of a Parmigiano Reggiano type system in Northern Italy uh, or in the Po Valley. So those animals can eat, you know, 0.48% of body weight and they have pretty high intakes. So it's, it's high above our, it's, it's higher than our fill maximum and they're still eating that amount. So um, perhaps that was pulling down that um, recommendation as a solid recommendation. And then even on our, what I'd call replacement forage diets or diets with low forage, where we're bringing in a lot of byproducts, we can see that same effect of, of you know, almost 0.5% of body weight um, as UNDF intake. So obviously there's some differences in UNDF is kind of what comes across here. And there's, there's some newer research out on that that I'll, I'll defer to here shortly. Um, but it's really something that I wouldn't hold that 0.3 to 0.4% of body weight as the, the holy grail that we were looking for with UNDF at this point. The other thing, and this is just, you know, this gets me every time, do you actually know the body weight of your cows? Because we very rarely actually have good body weights and we're just using the defaults. And so here we're relying on body weight as, as one of our formulation guidelines and we're just using the default from the program. So, you know, that's, that's a, probably a big area that we need to improve upon as we start to use those sort of metrics. Uh, I think this also somewhat pertains to some of the other uh, formulation guidelines that you see out there, such as forage, UNDF 30 intake. There's, there's a lot of different acronyms for it, but essentially just the amount of unavailable fiber after 30 hours of digestion um, coming from forage. My question for that one is, you know, what is the application in low forage diets and grass versus alfalfa diets, high byproduct diets? What about different types of cattle? If we're trying to target a certain number of pounds of forage UNDF intake or UNDF 30, you know, what happens when we're talking about a first lactation group versus a mature, body, or a mature group? Um, so a lot of those questions I kind of have related to that uh, metric. Uh, a couple other ones here, UNDF as a percent of dry matter intake. Um, another analogous one to it would be in, in the program if you're measuring everything would be car carbohydrate C as a percent of dry matter intake. Um, it, I use this one more so as a directionality of change. So if I'm formulating and I have a new forage coming in or if I have a, a change in, in forage allocation and I notice that my UNDF as a percent of dry matter intake just dropped half a point or a full point, then I would possibly expect a little bit of an increase in dry matter intake. Not that they're going to regain all the way back to their, you know, so that they're always eating the same amount of UNDF, um, but it's really just to tell me, okay, maybe I would expect an increase or decrease in dry matter intake. Uh, and this last one here I'm including is PEUNDF or PEUNDF 240. Um, newer one that's kind of come onto the scene now. Uh, I think there's some really interesting data behind it, and it's uh, really something kind of kind of interesting. But again, it's kind of like it's one of those preliminary ones. If you look at Rick Grant's webinar from February 2019, um, he gives a, a lot more data and background on this. I'd really encourage you to go look at that one. Um, you'll notice in there, and I think I did never actually heard him give us a formulation range, so you can tell it's pretty early. <laughs> but it's something to kind of keep an eye on in the, in the diets that you're working with. So, all right, so that's enough on NDF. We're going to shift to starch next. Now, this is the way I want you to think about starch overall for the model. Starch is going to be your best source of MP, okay? It's not necessarily an energy source for the cow. We need to think about it as an energy source for the rumen, which therefore provides us with MP. And that's why when you look at this chart, remember that corn grain starch digestibility is really influential in the model. 
for the MP level milk. But if you look at corn grain, or CB1 here, it's not nearly as influential as, as it is on the MP side. So it's something we really have to make sure that we are measuring and understanding. What I would say from, from my experience with helping model users all around the world is that starch digestibility has the single largest effect on predicted milk. Um, the next one after that would be just dry matter intake. But when someone sends me a farm and says the model's predicting 20 pounds off from where the cows are actually predicting, I oftentimes go through and say, okay, is starch digestibility realistic given the feeds that we know are on the farm? And so that's, that's oftentimes one of the biggest places to start if you are having trouble understanding the model's prediction versus the reality on farm. Now when it comes to starch digestibility, we have internal and external factors. So the internal factor would be floury versus flinty starch is kind of what I call it. It's essentially that vitreousness of the starch, okay? And this is the amount of pro protein that is kind of packaging up the starch um, molecule or starch granules in the actual corn um, or, or starch source overall. So in corn, we're talking typically about prolamins. And they kind of form this matrix of starch and protein. And that, uh, that matrix is actually what's trying to essentially preserve the, the seed and the, and the embryo for germination. So the plant's goal from a physiologic standpoint is to create a seed that does not degrade until temperature and conditions are right in the ground. So we don't want microbes going after these things. That's what the plant's thinking. Well, as nutritionists, on the other hand, we are thinking about how do we degrade this most effectively with microbes. So we're kind of fighting, we're fighting Mother Nature a little bit here, but that's why we have to resort to these kind of I'll call extreme methods of, of you know, physical disruption of that matrix and, and processing and silence. So all these different me mechanical processes that we go through helps make it more available for the microbes in the rumen. So grinding, heating, pressure, and siling, um, it's one of the reasons why you can take popcorn that is unpopped and it makes a very terrible feed and then actually popping it or even you know something like Milo, uh, popping it and it actually becomes a pretty good feed. So that, that kind of heating process allows us to um, basically disrupt that matrix in a pretty spectacular fashion, right, the popping. <laughs> and gives us a, a ability to actually utilize that starch. The other side of things influencing starch digestibility is I'll call the external factor. And this is really just that particle size. Okay, so we know that there's a big difference between whole corn and ground corn, um, and, and that really translates itself right through the animal. So here on the left side, you can see is a handful of silage I picked up. Um, they were calling it processed corn silage because there were no whole, whole kernels. But when you look at this handful, you can see, okay, partial kernels quite prevalent through here. You know, I can pick out several here. Well, when you went and looked at the cows, this is what the manure, this is, this is sift or uh, washed manure. This is what the result was. When you're looking at this, you can say, wow, I can actually pick out pieces of corn <laughs> still. So when we're talking about processed corn silage, we're really talking about as few kernels or, or remnants of kernels that we can find. We really wanna just obliterate those kernels as best we can. Otherwise we're going to see in the manure. Um, and that's just lost opportunity and then can also present some health challenges. What I'm using typically uh, to help me understand the, the fermentability, especially with that external factor of particle size um, on corn silage or maize silage, I'm gonna be using a processing score. And on the, uh, digestibility of, of dry corns or um, high moisture corn, I will oftentimes be using this. Um, I, I really find good success using the UW feed grain system. Um, that is a commercially available um, analysis as well because it actually gives me an adjusted KD based on particle size and, and distribution of particle size. So it's really helped me narrow down what the, what the real on-farm KD would be versus just the four millimeter in vitro seven hour starch digestibility. Um, so I, I typically rely pretty heavily on these, especially in, in corn grains. Um, so that's just kind of my, my preference. When it comes to that field application of any data you get from a lab, um, for CNCPS implementation, when we're talking about starch digestibility, it really relates to that, how, how we're characterizing carbohydrate B1 KP 
which is starch digestibility, and intestinal digestibility. So at this point, though, we're still left with some rules of thumb um, because it can be difficult to get all the needed analysis or, or to get good analysis or even just a good understanding of what's happening on the farm. So here's how I kind of walk through it with a producer. I'd say, all right, let's look at the corn silage. Do we have poor kernel processing? When I'm formulating, I'm gonna actually pick unprocessed out of the library. And that's because I actually, by doing that, I'm actually selecting a lower intestinal digestibility of starch, something that I don't measure in the lab, but the unprocessed values in the feed library have lower intestinal digestibility. So this basically helps me um, decrease that intestinal digestibility so that when I plug in a KD of let's say 15% per hour on a poor processed corn silage, then I am not biasing the model by introducing a low KD, but a high intestinal digestibility. So if there's more questions on this, uh, ask me towards the end. It's a little bit, um, maybe it was a little convoluted to explain, but uh, if you do, if you're running across poor processing, I always suggest you pick unprocessed as your base feed. For high moisture corn, uh, generally this is kind of just what we know, the, the new stuff or the green stuff going into the bunk will always have a lower KD and that increases over time of ensiling. Um, this is also affected by moisture level and ensiling. It's affected by a lot of different things. Um, this is why we um, really encourage testing, uh, especially if you have some measures that can adjust for that particle size. Now on the corn grain side, uh, I even use mean particle size to help me understand the digestibility. Um, typically below a thousand microns gets me into that 20% per hour range for a KD. Um, and you do wanna keep an eye on the distribution of particle size because I've come across corn, corn grain samples that are, um, I'll say kind of gone through an old particle or an old uh, hammer mill and there's a lot of powder and then there's a lot of larger pieces of kernels. And so that distribution really starts to get pretty wide and tells me that, well, okay, yes, the animal might utilize that, that corn flour fairly well, but there's a lot of larger pieces of, of starch and, and corn that are not going to be utilized in the rumen. So something to kind of keep in mind. Uh, my starch summary here, the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> this is what it basically is right now. So the good is we are at a similar place as we were about 15 years ago on NDFD. Um, the in vitro starch digestibility assay seems to be fairly sensitive to lab particle size, which is good for ground corn, but it's kind of tough for whole corn if you send that in because they're, the first thing they're gonna probably do is grind it to four millimeters. So now you've kind of thrown everything out the window for what actually relates to on-farm digestibility. Uh, we also think there's probably a single digestible pool with common time points as we're trying to measure starch digestibility. The bad is a lot of our data right now is focused around corn starch, maize starch. Um, we don't have a lot of data on small grains at this point. And um, I'll also say the bad still is a little bit of the oven versus microwave debate on, on how to dry starch in the lab um, for analysis. The ugly, at least for now, is again that particle size in the lab. You know, when they grind it to four millimeters, what does that actually mean? for the, the cow. Um, if it's a ground corn being sent in, maybe it's fairly similar, but if you're dealing with a cracked corn or something that's not anywhere near a four millimeter grind, then the data you get back from the lab isn't gonna be all as much, all that helpful. Um, there's a lot of on-farm variation in, in starch sources, especially regarding particle size. And then I'm gonna call the ugly drying starch as well, so it's bad and ugly. Um, just that, that still trying to understand what's the right way to dry this stuff down um, without affecting digestibility. So, um, overall progress is being made. A lot of the time we'll see lab derived KDs, they're popular. Um, but if you have questions about it, always ask the lab. And this goes for any analysis. If you ever have questions about your analysis, you're, you're paying them to run a sample for you, so you're paying for a service. If you have questions, call them and ask them. They should be able to help you walk through it um, and they should be willing to help figure out and troubleshoot any odd numbers that um, are there. I think too often people just take the value as it is and don't recognize that the lab is also there to help serve you, so. <clears throat> All right, the last one here, I said I'd talk about NDF, uh, starch and protein before we got to the final um, optimization side of things. So this will be a quick one on protein. Um, basically, I'll, I'll say, I'll give you a conceptual quiz. So when we look at those sensitivity analysis, you may have seen this before. So this is soybean meal protein B1, 
is the one here in green. Okay, and there's also corn grain B1, but let's just focus on that soybean meal one. What this is saying is it's saying that for every increase in soybean, in soybean meal digestibility by one standard deviation, we expect a decrease in MP allowable milk. So to put it a little more simply, we are increasing soybean meal digestibility, but we're leading to decreased allowable milk. Generally, we think increasing digestibility means increased milk, right? Digestibility is a good thing. But what we have to recognize is this analysis here is done on the rumen. This is increasing rumen soybean meal digestibility. So therefore, what we're doing is we're actually just increasing the digestibility in the rumen, which means we might not actually be taking full advantage of that protein um, because it just gets degraded to ammonia and maybe excreted into the environment. So when you're thinking about this, it's not that digestibility is a bad thing, but it depends on the source that's coming from. And this reason right here, this, this, you know, this is a fairly large number, 1.2 kilos of milk um, can be lost when we increase soybean meal digestibility. This is why protein treatment works so well, or why there's so many products out there that basically work to decrease digestibility or decrease rumen digestibility of soybean meal um, so that more of it gets to small intestine. Okay, soybean meal or any other, I mean, a lot of protein meals can go through these types of processes if they involve heat or, or um, you know, lignosulfonate, those sort of things. Those all are working to decrease rumen degradability, which therefore increases MP um, abilities from that, that product or MP supply from that product. Okay. Um, what we have to remember though, is that our, our protein is not really where the story ends. We also need to recognize that animals actually have amino acid requirements, not protein requirements. So when we look at that lysine methionine supply, anytime you're formulating with the model or anytime you're formulating or, or optimizing the model, you have to recognize that more than 50% of your lysine and methionine is going to be coming from microbes. And this is important because I think too often we, we think, oh, well, I'm going to amino acid balance, so I'm just going to bring in a protected amino acid source. Well, that's not really amino acid balancing, that's just supplementing. So if you really want amino acid balance, you should be focusing on microbes first, driving as much microbial protein as we can, and then coming in with targeted sources of lysine and methionine if we need them. And that's what I've kind of depicted here with metabolism of methionine. With a typical supplementation, um, it might account for quite a bit of our final metabolizable methionine supply. Um, but this is after we've tried to maximize the microbes as best we can. And ultimately, we really need to find good measures of amino acid availability in order to be able to use these models and optimizers. Um, I'll just have a, kind of one slide on here to help you understand when a, when a company presents you with information regarding amino acid availability. Um, there's always, I think, a benefit in thinking critically about the data that's being presented to you. Um, most of the procedures that we see is really rely on solubility or pores in a bag and filter. And so for uh, many protein products, the proteins are soluble, thus they escape the bag, yet they're indigestible. So we could take a, um, let's say even take an animal protein meal and we could cook it to a higher temperature so that it becomes quite rumen unavailable. Um, but it may still solubilize or may still um, escape the bag. And so in most of the kind of classic um, in situ type analyses, they would say it's digestible because it escaped the bag. But in reality, it doesn't provide any, any protein to the, the rumen or to the animal. So if we look at the three-step methods, in situ, mobile bags, they all suffer in this area because we're relying on solubility and escape from a, a bag or a filter. There are some other approaches out there. Uh, this is one, it, the enzyme inhibitor assay um, coming out of uh, Glenn Broderick had worked on quite a bit. I think it might be useful, um, but it's just historically not been applied at a commercial level. level. It's been, it's a pretty intensive um, process and I think a bit too intensive for most commercial labs to, to adopt. Um, I, I wonder if that's not something that needs to be revisited at this point because we're, we're able to generate NIR equations with a fewer number of lab reps than we did in the past. So maybe this is something that labs would consider um, to kind of think about how to possibly adapt this assay to a, a commercial um, application. Uh, the other side of things is that intestinal digestibility of escaped protein. 
So this is the digestibility of the stuff that actually gets out of the room and is still pretty hard to estimate. Now, finally, <laughs> what does this all have to do with optimization? Too often nutritionists want to click a button and have a diet formulated for them. This is actually pretty much how people request uh, using the optimizer. They say, I don't want to have to actually think. <laughs> I just want to click a button and it auto formulates for me. Um, I call this typically, I call it auto balancing. Um, and this is actually, this, is, this, can be, this type of formulation can be uh, problematic um, because ultimately to be successful with optimization, you actually have to understand the basics of how the CNCPS estimates nutrient supply. Otherwise, you'll, you'll tend to build optimization problems that aren't really relevant to the cow and may end up not being able to solve very easily because you're not recognizing some of the um, intricacies and nuances of, of how the model predicts supply. The other thing that, that can be dangerous with this is that a lot of products, especially rumen protected proteins, fats, and amino acids, they may be characterized to perform quite well in the model, in silico, okay? Meaning in the computer. The computer may tell you that this is going to be the best product ever. And it's going to make you tons of milk for so little money that the farm won't even know what to do. But the reality is not all of the products that are out there have proven themselves in the cow. And it's in the end, it's actually quite simple to make a model look good in the computer. It's a lot harder to make it look good in the cow. So if you're just relying on the optimizer to do your work for you, you will oftentimes see that the model wants to pull in a protected amino acid source or a protected, uh, more often it's a protected protein source and a protected fat because that's a real fast way to get ME and MP. And so you run the risk of including products that might not be needed. And there's also you know, that always in the back of your mind is, is there a real difference between one to two grams of, of MPAA? So what I'm saying here is if you look at some of the commercial amino acid products in the library, and if you enter them into the model at the same amount um, of, of product or even as the same amount of methionine, you'll see that they predict very close and maybe even within a couple grams or a couple percentages of um, intestinal digestibility, okay, or intestinal delivery. So if they say, okay, we, we provide 100 grams of product, you 60 grams of, of, um, of metabolizable amino acid, uh, that's oftentimes, you know, people will say, people will sometimes fight over 60 versus 61. The reality is there's so much variation on farm that does that really matter? Are you really that good at, at supplying a constant steady supply that that small difference actually matters? So it's something you gotta kind of keep in mind with when you're, when you're formulating and optimizing. And so, you know, what really the take home should be here is a formulation without any thoughtful consideration of the practical on-farm reality will be frustrating and can be quite expensive. Um, so what I'm saying is optimize the diet implementation first and then optimize the formulation, okay? So here's an example. This was from uh, a couple months ago. This was a farm that I was on that they said the diet was optimized. They had used the optimizer to optimize the diet. Um, and they were feeding through a vector system, through, through the, the Lely vector system. And so therefore, they were saying, well, a lot of the human error is taken out of it now. Okay, so implementation should be better than humans can do, because it's all computerized. It's all going to do the same thing every day. Well, this is what we saw on the farm. So on the right side of the picture, you'll see a feed bunk. And if you're looking at that, you should kind of recognize that, ah, okay. It's a lot of feed down at the far end and not a lot of feed down at the close end. If you look at the diet itself as it sits in the feed bunk, you can kind of pick out clumps of what in this case is grass silage. So the mix quality itself was pretty darn poor. Um, I don't know exactly if it was related to the amount that the vector was trying to mix or the um, processing level of the grass silage going in, but what was being delivered at the end was, was not a very good mix. And so you can see that cows figured that out pretty good. They, they figured out that, uh, oh, look, down here, there must have been a lot more goodies, a lot more stuff that they actually like to eat. And down here was not as much. So they clean up this part first, and then the low cows, et cetera, are the ones that um, go and eat this more, probably more fibrous um, diet. And that translated directly into the manure of the cows. That was, you know, it's, one of those moments where it all kind of comes together and you're like, ah, this is worth a picture <laughs> because it, 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 everything kind of makes sense, right? Issues with feed bunk management 
and issues with manure consistency. So two piles of manure in the same pen, the left one obviously very stiff and the right one um, fairly loose. So obviously these two types of animals are getting very different diets um, and we're not doing a good job of managing these animals in the system. So to me, yes, the diet may have been optimized on paper, but we had a lot of issues with implementation of that diet. So now we're actually gonna dig into those optimizers. You know, we've, we've harped on the implementation in the background enough. So now we'll talk about the actual optimizers that we have in AMTS Cattle Pro. Um, we have several different types here. So we have linear ration optimization. This is in the base program. Everyone has access to this. We have advanced optimization for nonlinear constraints. What this means is if you want to optimize on things that are not simple, like crude protein content of the ration, then the advanced optimizer will handle those better. We have a linear mix optimization. This is a little bit of a newer product that um, we're sort of making people aware of. Um, this is basically just optimizing a mix, and this is uh, on a linear least cost basis. So it can kind of help you formulating different types of uh, protein mixes or mineral mixes, calf pellets, etc. And then we have kind of packaged together the advanced and mixed optimization in our AMTS Cattle Pro AO Plus products. So this is the fully featured um, version of Pro, so all optimizers unlocked. I'll step through each one of these um, to kind of give you an idea of how I use them and how we, I see people successfully using them in the field. So starting with lean, least cost linear optimization, this is, this is kind of the typical um, least cost optimization. So we're just trying to reduce ration cost while meeting certain specs in the ration. Um, what I tell people is anytime you're using the optimizers, you can be setting constraints on the inputs and outputs. So I only have a certain amount of corn silage I can feed, so I'm gonna have a minimum and maximum for that. And I have a minimum and maximum for my um, characteristics of the final diet. So in this case, um, what the model is doing is it's using, uh, it's using linear algebra to calculate least cost ration formulation. Um, but when it encounters something like ME or MP, or what we call nonlinear constraints, uh, it actually has to kind of do an estimation to figure out, okay, what is approximately the right answer, um, even though it's not necessarily the correct calculation method, it's, it's trying to give us an estimation of those parameters. So it's, it's kind of using a curve peeling type process to help us understand what's the most likely diet that we can get back um, that meets all of the constraints, even though some of them are nonlinear. So I'm gonna switch here, this is a view of the program. And so when I'm walking someone through an optimizer, I always say kind of work left to right. So you will have your optimizer feed constraints, and this is the minimum and maximum. Typically for forages or any on-farm feeds, feeds that are stored on farm, you may be limited by inventories or uh, um, kind of some of those on-farm practical side of things. So you'd say, all right, I'm, I can only feed eight to 10 kilos of corn silage, dry matter, for this ration for this day or per day. When it comes down to the feeds that may be coming from off farm uh, or in a mineral mix or, or that sort of thing coming from the mill, uh, in that case, you'll typically be saying, all right, uh, I don't care if I don't use it, but I have a maximum just kind of based on my own formulation techniques or my own um, interests. You know, So here's dried distiller grains with solubles. You might say, all right, I never really want to feed more than two kilos per day. So that's my max. Um, and so you kind of go down through and you set up each of your constraints that way. If you want to lock in a certain ingredient, meaning that no matter what ration comes back, I always want to feed 150 grams of sodium bicarb, then that's what you do here, is you just set the min and max to the same numbers, okay? What I try to tell people is this is an intuitive constraint setting process. So you just set them according to how you want that final diet to look. Um, generally, the tighter, these constraints, the more difficulty that can be to finding a ration that meets all of them. If you leave a little bit more of them open, it gives the optimizer a little more flexibility to find solutions. Uh, you also will need to enter cost for each of the feeds. I recommend you enter in as close as you can the actual costs for the forages and don't just leave it at one cent or one dollar or zero. Um, that is not necessarily going to force the model to use more of them do that by fo focusing on the minimums, okay? Enter the real cost so that the optimizer actually has real information to work from. 
Now we're gonna switch over to the right hand side. So I've kind of just built a fairly simple template here to help us understand which um, type of constraints we wanna use when using the linear optimizer. So the linear optimizer, uh, typically I tell people to focus on the um, simple constraints like starch percent of dry matter and the FOM percent of dry matter. These are all what we call linear constraints because they actually don't require any of the model calculations. It's really just the calculation based on content of each of the feeds and the amount that each of the feeds is fed. So these are ones that you could easily calculate in Excel. Um, the linear optimizer is going to be best handled to handle these simple types of constraints, these linear constraints. If you want to include some of the nonlinear ones, ones that require the heavy duty model calculations like ME and MP, you can include them. It's going to use an estimation process to try to um, solve. And that can also lead to sometimes um, the model coming back with suboptimal solutions because it might not get it exactly right, but it gets it fairly close. Tom typically uh, evaluates on fewer and or, or optimizes on fewer uh, outputs than I do. I tend to include a few more. Um, it really comes down to your preference. I think the fewer you optimize on, the more likely you are to get a, a result back. Um, so that's just something to kind of keep in mind. When you click on the optimizer tab, so that's this tab up here. When you click that, it'll pull you to the screen and if the optimizer went through its checks and found that everything was okay, then it'll, it'll give you a solution, if a solution is possible. So the linear optimizer is pretty good at giving you an answer, even if the answer is not quite within all of your constraints. It'll tell you which ones are out of spec and by how much. And so you can kind of decide if that's okay, that's okay. I, I don't care that my, my maximum was 104 and I got 104.2 because that's such a, you know, such a small number. It, it's, a, it's a, essentially as close as I'll accept. Same thing with crude protein, 15.9 versus 16. I, that's probably fine because the amount of variation due to mixing overcomes that tenth of a point um, change. So, so it'll give you a suboptimal solution because it doesn't totally meet the constraints and then you can evaluate whether or not you accept it. Um, if you do accept it, you just click accept solution. When it comes down to nonlinear optimization, so this is the other optimizer, or uh, the other diet optimizer that's in the program. Um, we have to talk a little bit more about, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background into the, the way this works, because I think that can help you understand how to set up constraints. So with nonlinear optimization, we have to kind of understand the solution space is what I call it. So it's basically the, the range of possible solutions that the model is trying to um, find essentially. So it's defined by input and output constraints. And conceptually, we could kind of think about it as this 3D plane. And I typically like to call it like a mountain range. Okay. The goal of the optimizer is to find the diet that represents the highest peak, meaning let's say the highest income over feed cost or whatever your objective may be. Um, and so that's, you know, the optimizer is trying to find this number here on this, you know, multidimensional surface. This one that I've depicted here is what we would call a, a smooth nonlinear surface, meaning it's, it transitions nice and smooth from one, one point to another. This is actually fairly easy for most optimizers to solve. The reality is most of our um, diets and most of our optimization problems are non-smooth, meaning that there's a lot of false peaks, there's a lot of jagged parts, there may even be parts of the solution space that are entirely missing or what I mean by that is entirely infeasible. So this is where simple optimizers can be fooled because they may say, ah, we found this diet right here. It's the highest point of any of the points around us. So therefore it's the, it's the best diet. Well, the optimizer never even searched over here. So it doesn't even know that these points exist. Okay, so that's one of the challenges that we have with this type of optimization. And so the way we address that in the MTS is we actually use the principles of evolution and genetics to optimize, to, to find the, the optimal solution or as close to the optimal solution as we can approximate. So what we do is we generate an initial population of rations. So it's, let's say, 100 randomly generated rations with random feed amounts in between all of your constraints. And we evaluate them through the model. The ones that perform the best based on a fitness function, which is basically how well do they meet those constraints, those are the ones that are selected for the next generation. So then those top individuals are 
you know, I know this is kind of conceptual here, but the top individuals, those, those top rations from the first run are used to generate the next population of, of eligible rations, okay? And that's F1. And so this repeats itself until we no longer get any progress on fitness or no, no longer um, any better rations. And so visually, we could kind of think about it again as that mountain range. The mountain is above water. That's the portion that fit all of the constraints. Okay, so again, this is the solution space or the area that the possible rations may be. The individual stars here are individual rations tested by the optimizer. Okay, and so the first generation may be evenly spread around. Some of them will be acceptable, some will be unacceptable. And after breeding, eventually we will be able to converge upon this point um, by basically selection pressure, okay? So this is all, I know this is all conceptual and in the model, <laughs> in, in the you know computer, but essentially what we're saying is that we're learning from the previous rations that have been tested to try to find a better ration, okay? And that's all that's going on here. When you're using it, it's still that, that intuitive constraint setting. So you're just, you just need to tell the model where you want your feeds to end up, and then where you want your outputs to end up. Now with the advanced optimization, we are going to use two different sets of minimums and maximums. The way I tell people to think about this is the minimum and maximum will be the recommendations that you have. So you might say, I want to be between 16 and 18% crude protein, but I will accept a diet that's 15.5 and 18%. So that's what the safe maxes are. Safe maxes are your absolute boundaries, whereas min and max are your recommendations, okay? So when you set up your constraints in that manner, um, that's, what you're, that's what you're telling the optimizer. You know, I want you to stay between min and max, but if you have to go outside, it's okay in certain instances. Once you've set your constraints, you can then select which, uh, which outputs you want to optimize or you want the optimizer to actually pay attention to. That's just by selecting this little checkbox here. And that'll tell you, okay, yes, we are within a certain, um, you know, we have a certain number that we always tend to formulate with, so we're gonna choose those. The nice thing about the advanced optimizer is it can handle any type of constraint, linear or nonlinear, um, and it, it can handle a lot of them. So it's, um, it's a fairly flexible model, whereas with the uh, linear model, or the linear optimization protocol, it tends to perform better with fewer constraints. This one, you can, you can constrain quite a few on there. When you run the advanced optimizer, when you first click go by clicking the advanced optimizer button, uh, it'll start off and you'll see all these red bars flashing. Um, what it's doing is it's testing each of those rations. Remember I was talking about that population of 100 rations. Uh, and it's saying when it, when it violates the mins or maxes for any of these um, outputs. So as the optimizer is going, what I typically do is I typically just kind of keep an eye on this area, optimizer status values, and over here, the number of trials. And I basically just say, okay, am I making progress on my fitness? So does this fitness running average increase over time? And am I actually finding solutions? Is the optimizer actually finding solutions? If I see that this number, fitness running average, has stopped making progress, and I don't have any solutions, then I stop the optimization and I go back and maybe rethink through some of my constraints because obviously the, the optimizer is having trouble finding solutions. Um, typically, if it finds a solution, it will find it fairly quickly and then try to improve upon it. So in a successful optimization, this is what it might look like when you start off. This is what it'll look like towards the end, okay? And so I'm gonna toggle back and forth. You can see over time, it reduced all of the violations to find a population of rations that all meet the constraints fairly closely. And then it'll display the top number of rations, dependent on number of solutions to show. It'll display that and it'll let you, you know, you can go through and you can sort and figure out, okay, I want the one with the highest income over feed costs, um, or I want to do a multi-level sort. You have different options like that. So, uh, the best way to learn these optimizers, I typically tell people, is to just play with them. Keep trying them, seeing what you can do, trying to improve upon existing rations, um, and, and try to challenge your, your thought process on how you formulate. 
once you've amassed a few different rations from the optimizers, you can you can always use our ration shots tool. Um, so within both optimizers, there are buttons that say take ration shot. And so you can compare them between previous rations. So like this ration shot one here, this is the original ration versus the linear optimized ration versus the nonlinear optimized ration. And you can kind of compare them as you go across. And so that's usually quite useful to help you make that final decision as to which optimized ration you might want to select. And lastly, we'll talk about the mix optimizer. This is a, a little bit of a newer product that we have um, within Pro. So this allows users to formulate mixes on a least cost basis. Um, and, it's, and it's only for a mix. So we no longer are thinking about the animal uh, requirements. We're just trying to meet certain specs for a mist, for a mix, sorry. It's fairly simple to use. It speeds formulation for mineral and vitamin premixes, grain mixes, and protein supplements. Um, it's a pretty much a straightforward least cost optimizer. Um, it's as close to an auto balancer you can get for mixes. It's just not taking into account any really effects of the animal. It's just trying to meet certain specs. What I typically like to use it for is if I run across an on-farm mix from a mill that I might not actually know the, the actual mix, but I do have a feed tag, then what I can do is I can go through and I can build an optimization with any information that I have from the feed tag, including the guaranteed analysis and the ingredients that I know that they are using or most likely are using, okay? So this is a calf starter. And so when I'm looking through this ingredient list, I'd say, okay, plant protein products. You know what, if it's a calf starter, it's probably got, in, in our markets at least, in the US, it's probably got some soybean meal in it. So I'm gonna start with some soybean meal, processed grain byproducts. Um, maybe wheat heads, you know, grain byproducts or grain products, probably corn, you know, I kind of walk through each one of those to try to figure out what's the most likely types of products going in there. Enter in the guarantee analysis on your output constraints. And then you can go through and you can basically get pretty darn close, at least matching the feed tag of what that mix is. Okay. So here is an example. This is a mineral mix. So let's say I had a feed tag that gave me certain specs for each of the minerals going down through. I know what products are maybe typically used and I can enter in the price. You don't even necessarily need to do as much on the optimizer feed constraints um, because you're really just formulating to meet the final spec output. And so as long as you have price entered approximately correct and the min and max uh, from the guaranteed analysis, then you can actually get pretty darn close to formulating a workable mix, okay? Especially for unknown mixes. And the reason why price is important is because those price relationships actually should help the, or they do help the optimizer understand, okay, most mills are probably gonna formulate for least cost. You know, that's, that's where we typically find margin. So in that case, I should follow the same in my estimation of what that mix is. You know, so I need to make sure that my relationships between products at least are um, relatively on, on point. If you have questions about uh, the mix optimizer, we're more than willing to help answer those. Um, and we can even open up a trial to have you test it if you'd like. Um, that's all available within the program. So to kind of summarize these last couple slides here, my approach for optimization in AMTS uh, typically is always remembering these things when I'm doing diet optimization or overall formulation, you know, not even optimizing, just doing formulation. I always have to remember that garbage in equals garbage out. So if I have bad analysis, bad information, then I can't expect to build a good diet. In general, the optimizer should be used to challenge your preconceived notions of diet formulation. You may have in your head that I will never feed more than two kilos of wheat or you know, I'm never gonna feed more than a kilo of, of distiller's grains. What this can do is this can kind of help you say, hey, all right, if you're willing to go outside of those boundaries, we can still put together a diet that looks pretty good. And so that's, that's one, where, one area where the optimizers can be quite helpful. They can also help you reestablish price relationships. So you may have in your, idea, in your head that, okay, soybean meal um, versus canola meal always needs to have a however many dollar per ton spread. Well, in certain diets, it may be that that spread could be tighter or could be more um, broad. So what I mean by that is that, you know, maybe canola is a better buy in certain situations or certain types of animals 
Um, and the optimizer should help me understand that. If the optimizer consistently is pulling in canola versus soybean meal, even if I think canola is overpriced, then it should be, that's kind of telling me that, well, you know, the model thinks it actually might be something to use. Um, and so that's, that's to kind of help challenge your, your um, thought process on those types of feeds. I also say it's the, both optimizers are fairly good in that final tuning of a ration, meaning they, they can help you find that last you know, 10, 15 cents. If you've already got a fairly well-balanced ration in there already, they are pretty good at finding, okay, well, yeah, if we tweak things around a little bit, um, we can actually find a few more cents here and there. Uh, the optimizers in, in the model are not auto balancers. So you need to have some understanding of nutrition principles and some common sense to actually use these things effectively. Um, when you actually thoughtfully establish your constraints, um, then the optimizers can be, can be quite helpful in finding more economically efficient rations um, and help meet the goals that you lay out with your um, customers or on your farms. Uh, I oftentimes get these questions kind of when we're doing trainings, what are my typical parameters for optimization or, or formulation overall? Um, so I'll kind of share this. This is uh, very fluid based on where I'm working or, or who I'm working with. So if I'm working in, in you know, Europe or Germany, then they'll probably have much different values in terms of my mins and maxes because I'm dealing with much different feedstuffs, uh, especially when it comes down to di digestibility of, of uh, hay crop forages or grass silage. Um, so just to kind of summarize what you see here, um, my templates or my outputs that I'm paying most attention to, um, up on the top I have kind of that intake is always there, but then cost considerations. Um, next up is production. So that's ME and MP and energy corrected milk as a percent of body weight kind of helps me think across farms and across diets of, or across breeds as well. Next up is amino acids, helping me understand my essential amino acid balance along with my methionine and lysine. Rumen nitrogen balance, rumen energy, so all the fermentable carbohydrates. And then this big section here is all rumen health and milk fat, especially in the market as it's been in the last couple of years. Um, really trying to focus in on things that help get my, my milk fat up, my milk fat production up. Um, so here you can see I'm, I'm looking at total unsaturate, RUFAL, uh, C18-3 intake, DCAD, forage NDF, PE NDF, rumen pH. I'm looking at all of these to help me understand, okay, how is this rumen doing? You know, I've got my fermentable energy and my, my rumen nitrogen, but I really want to make sure that I can actually take advantage of those sources by keeping a healthy rumen. And then on the bottom here is just my diet nutrient concentrations, um, kind of the classical yeah, percent forage in the diet, crude protein, NDF. These are the things that um, over time for me, as I've been learning um, nutrition in general, have fallen to lower and lower uh, importance because I'm more interested in understanding some of these more, um, more intricate understandings of the rumen because you know, dietary starch doesn't really mean as much to me anymore as, as something like fermentable starch. Um, so that's just how my formulation has changed over time and how I've optimized. I typically formulate on, well, you can see all the bold ones here. These are what I, the ones that I pay attention to most when I'm optimizing. Um, so you can kind of see where that focus tends to be is meeting the cost considerations, overall milk, rumen nitrogen, fermentable starch and fiber, because those are my main sources of fermental energy. Um, and then some of my room and health parameters and then some of the final diet parameters as well. <clears throat> and so then my last slide here, this is a pop quiz. <laughs> so if you've been paying attention, you should kind of know the answer to this, um, or at least get pretty, pretty close. What is the most important on-farm tool for nutrient management, for nutrition management? Uh, so if you listen to Tom as well, Tom also presents this slide. Um, so the most important tool is not AMTS with all the optimizers. That's, that should not be your first answer. First answer should be something like this. Some way to measure dry matter. I don't care if it's, this is a, this is like a food dehydrator. This is a homemade, what they call vortex dryer, using a hair dryer. This is a commercially available one that I ran across in the Netherlands. Um, or the good old coster tester. Um, so I don't care which way you do it as long as you do it. <laughs> So if you can't do this part, then there's no sense using the model or optimizing if we really can't get that. Just 
basic dry matter measurement done. Um, a, a lot of our a lot of farms are doing it um, routinely, and that's great. There are still a lot of farms that don't. And as a nutritionist, you should be asking yourself, am I doing things to help the farm actually implement this? And you know, if you're handing the farm an as-fed formulation sheet, then that's not going to be good. <laughs> because if you're handing them an as-fed formulation sheet, you never actually give them the dry matter diet amounts. So if they are measuring dry matter on farm, how are they ever going to make an adjustment? So make sure you're enabling the farm to do these measurements routinely. And with that, I think I've taken up plenty of time, so we will stop the recording. And I thank you very much for uh, listening and we'll take any questions. Thank you, Sam. I hope everyone found that helpful. When we're doing a training, we try to hold the session to about an hour. People tend to glaze over when more information than that is presented. The nice thing about these webinars is that they are recorded and archived. You can always listen again. Before we get into questions for Sam, I'll remind you of our speaker and topic for next month. Professor Emeritus Tom Jenkins of Clemson in South Carolina will join us to talk about fatty acids. Some of you may be familiar with Tom from the Fatty Acid Forum webinar. We're very happy to have him present on fatty acids in the lactating cow diet. His talk will be September 12th at 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. These webinars are a boon to nutritionists worldwide, and I am lucky to work with some great co-hosts. The webinars are organized and produced by AMTS USA and Global. Our longtime collaborator is Paula Torillo of Afina, which hosts the series as El Webinar del Nutritionista. She receives support from Technal, Vinis Gladen, Guillermo Lerman, and RR Lab in Argentina. Several of our distributors serve as co-hosts in their countries. They are Marcelo Hens Ramos, who is also director of 3R Lab in Brazil. He delivers the webinar to our Portuguese-speaking audience. Director of Ansi Tech, Sean Lee, hosts the Mandarin Language webinar platform. Vadim Bekchagnikov of Nova Lab in Russia joins occasionally, and Elena Bonfante from Dairy Innovations Italia of Italy is a fantastic co-host who always has great questions. You know that generous sponsors make it possible for us to get great speakers and manage the program. We thank our gold sponsor, Arm & Hammer Animal Health, makers of cattle feed ingredients that optimize dairy cow health. Our silver sponsors this year are Ajinomoto Heartland, Superior Nutrition Through Amino Acids, makers of Agipro L, Dairyland Laboratories, Virtus, makers of Strata with EPA, DHA, Omega 3s, and Prequel with Omega 6s, Dairy One Forage Laboratory, and Jeffo, Life Made Easier. Our bronze sponsors are Amino Max, Purdue Agribusiness, Adiseo, Origination Inc., Nova Meal, Kemen, and PMI. Each of these companies support education and research worldwide. We hope that you will consider them in your formulation decisions. At this point, we will now go to the live question and answer session. I'll stop this recording and start live. Okay, everybody, hope that you found that really good. I have a great selection of co-hosts. I'm gonna switch over to Sam's slides if you give me a second to make sure that we, if he wants us to, we can move through those slides. Oh, I've chosen the wrong thing. Um, we can move through those slides so that you, he can um, talk to a specific slide if you have those questions. Hold on a second. Never been good at clicking and talking at the same time. Um, just to reiterate, usually I don't quite know who's going to join me for my co-host, especially in the morning webinar. This time, because Elena is not available, we have Bill Prokop, who is also with Dairy Innovations Italia, joining us to ask questions um, from his perspective. Ignacio, um, Ignacio Riano from our Argentinian distributor is also with us and he's going to ask some questions. I encouraged all our distributors to join us because they don't always get the opportunity to ask Sam questions. So with that, I'm going to unmute my co-hosts and everybody can say hello to everyone and then we'll start with a few questions. So go ahead, people. You are unmuted in theory. No, you're not. <laughs> there, now you're unmuted. Hi, hello. How must I, Sam? Hello, hello, ciao. <laughs> All right. Um, Bill 
Ignacio, I, if you have some questions, I know Ignacio has one. Ignacio, do you want to lead us off and then we'll come around to you, Bill, and I have a couple questions in my window. Anybody who's listening, please add questions and I will shut up. Okay. Thanks, Sam, for the presentation. Um, I was wondering if you can add some information about the digestibility of the PD-1 of protein like canola or other sources that are in the market or the blend of canola and soybean meal? Yeah, so that's actually a really good question. Um, I think if we uh, are able to go back to one of the slides, I think maybe we'll frame it using that. So I don't know who needs to control, but it's slide 33 in my presentation, I think. Yeah, Sam, I can move to it if you can tell me when I get close. Uh, so 30, slide 33. So actually go up about right there, right there. That'll this one? Any of the, um, go down. Actually go just after the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's where we're going. Okay, right there. There we go. Yeah, so I, I like to use this slide to sort of frame that, uh, that discussion. Um, what you're essentially asking is, Sorry. <laughs> uh, it's basically, how, yeah, how important is it to know that, that protein B1 and, and how can we measure that? Because we know there's got to be differences in digestibility um, based on sources and especially when it comes down to blends. Is that, is that a fair question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you can see there, if you look on the right-hand side where that MP allowable milk, uh, the effect of soybean meal PB1 digestibility is actually quite strong. The, mm -hmm. the difficulty here is, is we don't have very good assays out there to um, actually measure this in the field. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's kind of, I'd say, one of the larger struggles there are right now in terms of characterizing feeds for the model. Um, I think there are some, some more research-based techniques out there that might be uh, useful, including that uh, um, kind of enzyme inhibitor assay may be something that, that sort of needs to be revived. But, you know, it depends on what the commercially um, commercial success of that could be um, because it, it is a pr pretty intensive assay. So what we're really looking at is we need to get some idea of what that digestibility or the rate of digestibility on those, on those meat, bean meal type um, or, or even any protein B1. Uh, and at this point, we really don't have very many good op options. It's kind of what it comes down to. So my advice when you're trying to characterize things is try to have a good understanding of how much heating and how much processing any of these uh, types of proteins have gone through. Because um, generally, if you look at uh, when you apply heat or, or any sort of process like that to that, that B1 fraction, especially in the presence of sugars, uh, you'll end up creating some of those Maillard products. And if you do it carefully, then that's still fairly digestible to the cow. If you do it too hot, too long, uh, you'll end up just kind of making fairly expensive manure. So. Okay, okay, thanks. All right, um, Ignacio, if you have more questions, we'll, um, we can keep going or we can come back. Yeah, we come back for the moment, I'm okay. Okay, Bill, are you, do you have any questions or comments you would like to make? Sure, so Sam, great presentation. Um, you covered a lot of ground in a very efficient amount of time. I applaud you for that. Um, and throughout this, and I know you can identify with this, but I, I kept hearing the words of George E.P. Box, Nobel laureate statistician that said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I think you hit upon something that the nutritional field, the nutritionists that use the models have to embrace is that these tools are still highly limited by our ability to characterize feeds and also by the ability of the nutritionist to understand the feed that they're working with and, and the, the nutrient constraints of it. And so I think he did a great job of emphasizing that um, because there's no criticism of our labs. I think our labs are doing a tremendous job of helping us characterize the carbohydrate fractions, which are still probably the, the weakest part of our understanding. Uh, and that's an observation, not a criticism. But it, it, it certainly, as you indicated, drives the room. And, and when we have assumptions that are wrong about the rate of fermentation of a particular carbohydrate, it definitely can impair our ability to predict results. 
So I was intrigued by your KD of 20 for ground corn. Um, what assay is giving you that? Is that a, a modified fermentable in vitro? Or I'm, I'm just curious because I've never had ground corn numbers come over 20. Usually they're in the low teens. Yeah, yeah. So typically the way I try to try to help frame that is, is the more, I mean, the closer to fine powder that you are, um, the closer you'll get to that 20% KD per hour. Um, I, you know, when I'm testing, I, I usually use the UW grain analysis and you might get a, just a kind of normal seven hour starch digestibility in those teens. But then when they take into effect, kind of the effect, I'll say of particle size, um, moisture, prolamin content, uh, that's, that's where you can tend to have a, a little bit higher, um, KD exhibited that way. Uh, it's, it's rare that I see over 20% per hour. Um, so that, you know, that is, I'll say that is a high number. Um, but then if you get towards obviously the higher moisture corns, then you will, you will see that. Right. No, I understand that. Um, cause we've even assayed the corn since we were, we're in the market where we're using a lot of hog, um, corn grind mills. And so we're getting 400 micron or at least 600 yep. micron. And I still don't get good numbers like that, but it, it just pushes me to want to look a little closer. Um, uh, so I, that's, that's fine. Yeah. It's, it's a, I mean, it's a tricky one that I think we'll, like I said, I think we're, we're getting, getting better with our, our grain analysis. Um, but it's, yeah, <laughs> the, the largest, sometimes on, on different uh, presentations or during different trains, I try to tell people what are my most common questions or when someone sends me a file to look at, uh, starch digestibility is one of the first ones I look at because it's, it can have huge effects on the model and, you know, and, and to your kind of earlier discussion there, Bill, um, there are very legitimate and valid critiques of using the CNCPS or, or the overall use of models um, when it is so sensitive to a, a measure like that um, and, and kind of pushing for people to understand that, yeah, these are, these are all assumptions that we're making. You know, the model's not perfect. It's not reality. I think the way Mike used to put it, never fall in love with a model, she'll break your heart. <laughs> so, so that's, you know, I it kind of you take that, take that advice all the way. Cause that's, um, that's really the reality here is that we're trying to use them as tools, but they definitely get things wrong. Uh, the model does. And but so but we, that. we have to recognize that we are trying to model biological systems, which inherently homeoretically homeostatically are going to be plagued with variation. Right. And right. so the fact that we come as close as we do, I think is incredible. And I think the key here as you pointed out, is to eliminate as much of the variability that we can control, whether it's on farm management procedures or even with our lab analyses and not accept a single page of analyses. Because as I tell audiences that I present to, as you do, we fall in love with numbers. They're really sexy to have all this data, but data is not knowledge. And I jokingly tell them when they look at that analysis, it's all lies. And it's not right. that that's true, but every lab has its biases, right? And so as long as the bias is consistent and we start taking averages of analysis and not relying on one, I think we help the model become highly predictive and get closer to what we, you know, expect from it. And as I said, certainly not perfect. Yeah. But, uh, so. that's yeah, I think, you know, the way I kind of say it too is that the, uh, you know, if you look at the papers that evaluate the CNCPS and its ability to predict ME or MP level milk, um, that's not a best case scenario because when you're looking at, when you do these uh, kind of literature searches and you pull out all the studies and, and start entering in dry matter intake and, and milk production and um, whatever information you might have reported about the feeds, it's actually most of the time those studies are more poorly characterized than you would on any farm because no one necessarily reports all the things needed to, the, all the things you typically have in a, in a contemporary analysis. And you're using, you know, treatment means that are adjusted by the model, by the statistical models they're using. And so when we say, you know, plus or minus 5% on, on milk production, you know, on a hundred pound cow, that's, I'm, I'm telling you that the model can predict plus or minus five pounds. That's not enough precision for most nutritionists. Right. In, in, in reality, with, with correct analysis and, and careful thought you know, of entering in the, all the information, 
yeah, so you should on farm see a, a lot tighter um, uh, error around that number. Um, but the key is there's still an error. There's always an error. <laughs> no, agreed. But uh, um, the, as you pointed out, the, the, fir the limiting first limiting step on most areas is not the model yeah. and and that's but um yeah i think this is the, the model is tremendously didactic in that category because it helps us wake up to the fact that maybe there's things we're not considering or we have to take a step back and challenge our assumptions our mental models are wrong and it allows for you know opportunity i guess is the the best way to put it yeah yeah thank you Thank, thank you, Bill. This is sort of one of the things we've always envisioned in doing these webinars is to eventually have like, sort of a podcast and VJ endearingly calls it cows and coffee um, where we get this sort of exchange of ideas. So I really appreciate that discussion. Um, Sam, in regards to the starch digestibilities, I had a question in my chat of um, what time points would you say are relevant for starch? Uh, well, that's a good question. <laughs> right now, right, the commercial, uh, I'll say generally commercially available ones are, are seven hours, sometimes we see a two hour. Um, a, lot of the, the, a lot of the data that I've seen or, or at least even generated and participated in generating um, will run several time points, usually something around two, four, six, and then out to maybe even 48 hours uh, to try to identify where the, if there is and where a possible, you know, unavailable starch portion is. Um, you know, commercially for labs right now, we obviously we don't need to do that many, um, but I, I would suspect that there'd be some value in, in adding a, a somewhat earlier time point just to get an idea of, of how fast that stuff can go. Um, but it's, yeah, I, I'm kind of waffling around the, the answer, I know, but um, something something in that mid-range, right? So, I mean, we currently have seven, so let's stick with that. And then I think there, there could be benefit to a two, and there may be benefit to something out around 30 or 48, um, just to kind of really understand what that curve looks like. I think more important, though, than just the time points is going to be figuring out how to essentially adjust the rate for particle size, be it kernel processing or grind size or dry matter content, prolimate, et cetera. I mean, I think that's gonna be getting us a little bit more progress than just doing more time points because the time points are still gonna be done on a four millimeter grind in the lab, which has nothing to do with the on-farm grind size. Yeah, starch is something that I'm sort of striving to bring into another webinar topic. Um, just as an aside, Kyle Taysom from Dairyland had kind of an interesting picture and discussion in his LinkedIn feed this week. I think I wasted a few minutes while drinking my coffee one morning looking at that. And he, he had a picture of some starch um, that came in, uh, a lab sample that came in, and he questioned, is this a well-processed sample? Um, and, and it wasn't necessarily clear cut. Um, and Bill, Ignacio, certainly chime in if you have any other observations. I've got some really great, powerful nutritionists in the attendee list, and I know that you don't have as much control over how you can talk. So shoot, shoot me a, um, a chat message, and I can even probably even see if I can get you able to discuss. Um, I do see a chat down there. Do uh, yeah, I'm going to ask that right now. So I have uh, a question from Adolfo. He says, "How important is sugar in the diet to help microbial fermentation in the rumen, especially during the first two hours of fermentation? How does a model predict a better NDF fermentation by adding sugar sucrose to the diet?" Yeah, so sugar definitely has a place in diets. Um, I think. If you look at the research, it would indicate that they, it might not have as negative an of an effect on, on pH or at least the drop in pH as maybe a, a starch does or a highly fermentable starch. Um, so I think there's some intriguing aspects to that. It does create different end products from fermentation. Um, so that also, I mean, that's, that's why it's somewhat related to that, uh, not so much of a drop in pH. Uh, there are some questions I'd say in sugars in general, you know, how much, if it's coming in as a soluble form, 
how much is going to be um, escaping and how much is going to pass. Um, I think if we generally have sort of assumed that it's rapidly degraded because of the propensity for microbes to take sugar and, and even just store it away, not even ferment it right away, just uh, to store it. Um, so I think, you know, there, there's some questions as to whether or not that should be termed degraded or if it's actually still present means it hasn't actually formed a new micro or hasn't helped drive the energy to form a new microbial um, cell. So is it really degraded at that point? It's really kind of just disappeared, at least from how the model looks at it. Uh, so, so yeah, that, I think there's still, still some questions there. I'd, I'd say the estimates that I've seen from in vivo studies would say that uh, in the rumen we can run from 60 percent digested all the way up to 95 or, or more digested um, in the rumen. Uh, so I think there's some opportunity for us to help other, to try to understand that a little bit more going forward. As, as, as the model actually handles sugar, especially relating to NDF digestibility, um, it's, I'll say it's not very sensitive at this point. Uh, when you bring in sugar uh, or even a fermentable starch, I'm gonna kind of, they're gonna be analogous here in the model a little bit. Uh, they can drop some predictions of pH, but that's kind of where the effect ends. Um, any effect on rumen NDF digestion is actually going to be coming through PENDF. So at that point, if you're leaving a diet, you know, with a fairly similar level of PENDF, then you're not actually going to be doing much to the fiber degradation. The only, I guess the only switch I'd say in the model to really hurt that fiber degradation is going to come from a, a low PENDF situation. Um, and so that's, that's where that starts to get adjusted. And that's why I'd say it's not really all that um, sensitive to it at, at this point. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Sam. Now, I don't have any more questions in my window, so I'm going to rely on Ignacio and Bill if they have something they want to discuss. Um, go ahead. Otherwise, we can let Sam go for the morning. We'll be back again at this this afternoon with another group of attendees. And I have, let's see, a question. Excellent. Um, <laughs> let's see, Sam, would you walk through your process in estimating dry matter intake when, you utilize, when utilizing a forage with very low NDF? like you showed in your sample. Are you estimating fill with a combination of 120 and 240 um, NDF, or are you interpreting, let's see, how do you interpret if very low NDF results in NDF as a percent of body weight being below normal values? Okay, so I think I heard a couple questions there. Is there so the first one related to dry matter? Uh, yeah, do you, um, can you see the question and answer window, Sam? Let's see. Because this is probably a good one to visualize. Okay. If not, I can throw it over into chat. Yep, I can see it there. Okay. Okay, so. Yeah, uh, okay, dry matter intake now. Dry matter. Okay, yep. Um, yeah, so <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. At this point, I'm not. I'm not certain I have specific uh, formulation guidelines that I target. So I will actually, mom, I'll tell you what slide I'd like you to go to to help talk about this. Uh, slide 25. Okay. 25 of my 25 or 25 of your original? This one? Uh, um, two, two after that, 27 for you. Okay. Yep. All right. So these are the, the kind of UNDF discussion points that we have. Uh, what I typically do is I look at that UNDF as a percent of dry matter intake um, and I'll get an idea of where this farm or, or this diet has been kind of settled out. So let's say I'm, you know, working along with a, with a diet or with a group of cows and they seem to be kind of steady at total UNDF as a percent of dry matter intake at 9%, let's say. If I'm doing a ration formulation change and my new ration comes in at 8.5%, then I might expect a little bit of an increase in intake because I'm essentially providing a little bit less UNDF. And this is UNDF coming from all sources. Um, so it's a combination of 120 and 240. So 240 on the forages and 120 on the, the non-forage. Uh, when you look at some of the very low, let's see if I'm looking here, low NDFD. Ah, so, so very, very heavy for, or very, uh, indigestible forages is what that would mean. 
Estimating fill from a combination. Yeah, see, at that point, I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of letting that, that UNDF as a dry matter intake, not necessarily total fill, um, drive the ship there. And NDF as a percent of body weight, it, yeah. I, I don't necessarily use it that often, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, if I'm out in the, <laughs> in the odd diets where I'm dealing with yeah, emergency forage or low forage situations, um, that's where I kind of have to let the cows tell me where they're comfortable and then try to try to run with them. Um, I know it might not be the answer that you, <laughs> that you want, but it's, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think any of these, any individual one of these is going to totally tell me where I can end up. If that makes any sense. All right. Um, Sam, I have, a, Bill, did you have a comment on this particular question? I have you unmuted. No, not on this in particular, although um, just a, a heads up, but maybe it's intuitive, but I'll share it. When you, when you run these diets with, that are high in byproducts, non-forage fiber, um, it's amazing how well the cows will do, but it's the ultimate test of bunk management because it's so critical that we learn to feed for a higher level of intake or there's a train wreck imminent. And sometimes coming out of the starting gate, that's not recognized because they will empty out and you'll have a, a slug feeding effect that like you've never seen. So anyway, that's just an aside there. Um, yeah. yeah. And when you, when you think about even the, the feed stuffs that you're usually bringing in, you gotta be a little bit careful, like what sort of unsaturated fatty acids you're bringing in and cause that's going to be a, a quite a bit higher uh, amount and rate of passage. So your outflow will be quite a little bit more than you're accustomed to. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Bill, if you kind of remember from Ali's study, uh, you know, it looked like butter fat tanked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, the cows were making quite a bit more milk and butter fat shipped amount was actually pretty level. Yep. But yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting, you know, good learning experience, I think. All right. Um, Sam, I have, and, and then Bill, will come back to the, you had a subsequent question or comment. Um, I have a question. Do you use seven hour starch or the KD from Cumberland Valley lab for starch digestion? At least at one point, they seem slightly different. Seven hours seems to come in on the standard XML import. Thanks. Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, and it's a, a good point to bring up. So we, we have the ability to import the seven hour or the KD. We can't import both. Uh, because the calculator is embedded in the program as well. So what we've done is we've worked with the labs to kind of determine which one seems to, to make the most sense um, to have on the next standard XML import. So for Cumberland Valley, I believe it's the seven hour starch. Uh, that's what actually is, that, that's what actually comes in. Um, so yeah, uh, that's the one you probably should be using. That's kind of what we worked with them to, to determine what, what makes sense. Uh, I think if you take another example, it'd be like Rock River Lab, we are importing the KD on that one, um, if I remember correctly, uh, because that, that KD seems to be, um, to reflect what the starch digestibility uh, is. So yeah, it, it's a little bit different sometimes between labs, um, and that's something that the user, right, if you have questions, always ask us, ask the lab. Uh, that's the, the only way that we'll, <laughs> we'll be able to solve anything. Uh, and then just kind of a note on the seven hour from any lab, right? It is a four millimeter grind for the most part. Um, so if you're sending in, if you send in a whole corn, they're going to grind it to four mil to seven, or sorry, to four millimeters and do a seven hour starch. And that might not necessarily pertain to what's going on on the farm. Okay. Thanks. Bill, did you, um, did you have something you wanted to say? Uh, just a comment, you know, most of these starch assays are, um, we're looking at vitreous, not amorphous endosperm. And Sam, as you know from some of your experience at the research dairy, when we fed the flowery endosperm corn silages, um, it, it almost seems like the models are better at predicting perhaps because of a, a more, I'll use the word reliable or predictable fermentation of that material in the rumen and even the seven hour starch assays that we get back on it. Um, but you pointed out the fact that, and I think this is so critical, the opportunity is to get more fermentable starch in or decrease how much degradable the, the B1 protein is swimming around there or use technologies that help that B1 escape before it's degraded, deaminated in the rumen. And so 
you know, failing, um, getting more fermentable starch of the source that we want safely into the rumen, maybe the technologies that provide for uh, rumen escape of V1 to improve MP, you know, are more of an immediate future. Any thoughts? Yeah, yep. So that's, um, it's oftentimes the central balance of any, any diet that I'm kind of working with or, or people that I'm working with because it's, yeah, we, I always try to focus on getting as much fermentable starch as we, as we can in there within the, the realities of the farm. So if you've got pork feed monk management, if you've got issues adjusting dry matters regularly, then right, you might not be able to get as much fermentable starch in there. So then you have to turn to the, the other sources, which tend to be a little bit more expensive in terms of protecting that uh, degradable portion and, and getting out of the room. And um, I think there's, and historically there's been quite a bit of research on products or, or compounds that decrease the degradability of, uh, of proteins in the rumen overall. Um, so I think there, right, there's some good, good future and good, uh, good opportunity for those sort of products to, to help us, especially if we're trying to feed, um, a lot of the hay crop silages with a lot of degradable protein or um, other on-farm protein sources. Um, I think it can be a good opportunity there. Okay. Um, Ignacio, do you have any um, questions that you want to ask? And I'll unmute you. Oh, no, good. You got it. Right. Okay, great. Um, if we don't have any more questions in our Q&A or um, in our chat window, I think we'll let everybody go. I super appreciate um, all of you who attended and the questions that were asked. And Bill, thank you for coming in as a, a short notice co-host. It, um, it, a good exchange is always valuable. Prego. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, Sam, we'll talk to you this afternoon. And other than that, we'll sign off. All right. Sounds all right. Good. Thank you all for uh, joining, and yeah, thanks for the discussion. Thanks, yep, and yep. yeah, Bill, if you're free tonight, feel free to join. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. All right, thanks everybody. All right, bye. Ciao, ciao. ciao.